الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. It's only right that people have confidence in who they take knowledge from. I'm not shy, but I am private for personal and professional reasons. So rather than give an all-access bio, I hope viewers will instead be content with a tour of some of my work in the real world. Of course, recalling one's good deeds in public risks depriving oneself of the reward. Ikhlas, sincerity for the sake of Allah, is a requisite precondition for any action to be accepted. Sadaqa, charity, all the more, ought to be a jealously guarded secret between a servant and his lord. So much so that one's left hand remains oblivious as to what one's right hand spends in God's way. That being said, as you still won't really know who I am merely on account of my telling you what I do, I hope in sharing some of the opportunities that I've been blessed with, in spite of my unworthiness, I won't be ruining my ikhlas. May Allah forgive us and keep us sincere. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The next time you perform Hajj or Umrah, browse the bookshelves by the airport prayer rooms and you might happen across this. That's my book. Well, partially mine. The actual author's name is on the cover. But I did edit it and contribute a chapter to it. If I see him, who did the cartoon about Muhammad? If I see him, I kill him. That's it. It's shortcut. In the wake of the Danish Muhammad cartoons controversy of 2005, one committee of wealthy Saudis, and there's no shortage of them, got together to formulate a response. They decided to fund the mass publishing in several languages and mass free distribution of a book introducing non-Muslims to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, his noble character and his manners. The very opposite image that was being portrayed in the offensive Danish caricatures. Hundreds of thousands of copies were dispatched, including box lords directly to Denmark where the controversy had first started. What impact the book had on the non-Muslims it was written for, we have no way of knowing. What we do know is that every year within the KSA, many thousands of non-Muslims do embrace Islam. These are mostly foreign workers, so-called guest workers, and their conversions are, we're ashamed to say, in spite of the negatives that many foreigners experience in the Gulf. But mercifully there are, as with every Muslim society, many kind-hearted and good-natured believers. From these more consciously Islamic of the Muslims are the Ahlul Khair, the good-doers, well-to-do Muslims who privately fund and maintain charitable Islamic projects, especially after spending sadaqa overseas became next to impossible following 9-11. العديد من البرامج التي تقدمها هذه المكاتب في دعوة غير المسلمين للإسلام وما أثمر ذلك من دخول الكثير من غير المسلمين في هذا الدين بفضل الله عز وجل. Of the citizen-funded projects are the private Islamic outreach offices, dawah centers to you and I. These are multi-story, multi-function complexes providing welcoming environments and safe spaces for non-Muslims and unlearned Muslims to learn about Islam, study the Arabic language and the Quran, and enjoy downtime with competent and credentialed outreach officers, who are often graduates from local Islamic institutions. Most of KSA's foreigners who convert to Islam do so through these facilities. I worked on a number of Islamic projects for a number of these outreach offices especially after being introduced to some of their benefactors, high net worth individuals who wash their businesses' wealth with Zamzam, in a manner of speaking. Most of my work centered on original authorship of English language dawah material, inviting non-Muslims to Islam, or teaching newly practicing Muslims the basics of their religious belief and the proofs for its being true. The aforementioned book on the Prophet ﷺ was prepared in one such office. But moonlighting in the Middle Eastern dawah sphere doesn't come without its challenges. For example, I would increasingly clash with this one American expatriate we'll call M, who would eventually be expelled or barred re-entry to the KSA. See, as well as in-house face-to-face dawah, the offices also run remote dawah campaigns over the internet, which are documented through meticulous bookkeeping. They have to, as it's the reporting of the successful campaigns, especially the conversions to Islam of foreigners, that encourage the wealthy donors to keep their donations flowing. There was this one convert from the States, a sister who had taken a shahada through one of the live chat programs. 
She'd been working in the military industrial complex. Northrop Grumman, maybe Lockheed Martin, can't remember exactly. Anyway, M told her that unless she immediately quit her career for one outside of US military manufacturing, her Islam would be invalidated, as she would be aiding the disbelievers against the believers. I was stunned. Here you had a Western woman from the American Midwest, maybe a mother with a family to support, who had only just embraced Islam, quite possibly after having had her doubts dispelled after reading some of my own literature and interacted with my own e-Quran facility, a PHP SQL Quran app before apps were even a thing, now being told that her Islam was in the balance unless she resigned forthwith from her job. In fact, M told me, all giddy as a goose on juice, that the welcome dawah Paxi was responsible for preparing and dispatching to overseas English-speaking converts included material establishing the major kufr of those who aided non-Muslims. Can you imagine? Could there be a greater dereliction of duty of care? Incidentally, some years later, I attended a closed meeting being chaired by a senior official at Imam Muhammad bin Saud Islamic University, the establishment where I had been a listening student. During the Q&A, I said to the Sheikh, this treatise, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab's Nawaqid al-Islam, the nullifiers of Islam, I feel it can be quite dangerous in the wrong hands, and that its distribution and availability in the West at least, amongst the common people, can cause more harm than good. Bear in mind, by this stage, I'd already debated several takfiris or arguing points from said text. Anyway, how do you think the Sheikh responded? Remember, we're talking a high-ranking Najdi cleric at the flagship Islamic Institute in their capital, one that bears the name of the Emir of Dariya, who founded the first Saudi state, and who was the protector of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and father-in-law to his daughter, and the university that bears his name being under the direct supervision of a minister who is a direct living descendant of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. How do you think the quote-unquote Wahhabi Sheikh responded to my suggestion that one of the most well-known works of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab should essentially be barred from western shores. He said, Brother, I agree with you. By now, I'd moved on to larger standalone projects with the private offices of some of the people of knowledge within the kingdom, the generous compensations of which I would use to launch my own dawah initiatives overseas, especially in the transitional economies of the former Soviet space. As for M, the last I heard of him was on the 19th of November 2011, when a US correspondent blogged an announcement from Al-Qaeda about the death of one of their commanders during a security forces raid in Karachi, Pakistan, the previous day. This was the photo the Pakistani authorities released of the slain AQ operative. The AQ-affiliated Global Islamic Media Front's obituary on M described him as a senior media official within the organization and head of its translation department and that he was behind the creation of local media groups propagandizing in Arabic, Urdu, Bengali, and, as I had the misfortune to witness firsthand, English. According to the Pakistani authorities, he was found with a hit list and over 150 million rupees, over 1.62 million US dollars. He killed himself to avoid capture by the Pakistani rangers, detonating a grenade. He about that life. And death. And now we know why. For this was when Al-Qaeda were at the height of their power. Few were those who would challenge their theological underpinnings head on. As for me, I didn't give a bollocks. These devils were destroying not only innocent lives, but the innocence of the Dawa itself. If standing up for the truth makes one a target for takfiri reprisals, all one can do is avoid unnecessary exposure, but not at the cost of staying silent. Not when we've brothers and sisters in other parts of the world championing the sunnah in the face of dangers that are much clearer and ever more present. Take for example the Sheikh Abu Yahya Krimsky. Abu Yahya is the senior most scholar of the Ukraine after having resettled there following the Russian annexation of his Crimean motherland in 2014. His Aryan features giving away the Greco-Gothic ancestry that is Aboriginal to that peninsula. I visited the Sheikh when Crimea was still de facto under Ukrainian control and shortly after he had been shot six times point-blank by a takfiri. He took one bullet to the face and five to his upper body. 
unsurprisingly, he is considered a walking miracle. The danger from the jihadiyya, the neo kharijiyya is real, as real as the bullets that pierced Abu Yahya's body. But there is a fine line between being brave and being reckless, and this is why I value my anonymity. It allows me to operate how I do, where I do. There are still costs, like being barred entry as persona non grata in some jurisdictions, not due to any intervention initiated by non-Muslims, I hasten to add, but by the jealous, misguided Muslims who are fearful of losing their privilege, their pensions and their stranglehold on state-sponsored Islamic institutions. Which brings me on to the Sheikh Imran Latvi, Oleg Petrov. В Коране также сказано, что тот, кто убил человека не по несправедливо, факанна макатал он наша джамия. He was the Imam of the Muslims of Latvia, charismatic, learned, a graduate from Medina's Islamic University, and local. Here he is appearing on national television, being an ethnic Latvian convert, as was his wife and members of their extended family. He was the relatable, reasonable, qualified, well-spoken face of indigenous Islam in his country. Alas, here he is again in a Daesh propaganda video. На самом деле, единственное наказание за издевательство над любыми исламскими ценностями является смертная казнь. И в этом не разногласит никто из мусульман. He went from being a poster boy of Sunni Islam in Europe with no history of extremism to being a recruiting sergeant for the most egregious example of extremism in our time, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Sham. It was a PR catastrophe one from which his former congregation were forced to distance themselves. I reached out to the brother, Imran, whilst he was in Daesh country and tried to reason with him, tried to convince him to quit Syria and return home. He had his proofs and knew how to deploy them. But that wasn't what made the task of trying to de-radicalize him challenging. It was that our communication was undoubtedly being monitored by Daesh High Command. So not only were we speaking to each other, Imran Latvi and I, but also through each other, sending subliminal messages to the bro's Kharijite handlers, conscious that, should he express any regret for having joined their Dajjalian Caliphate, they'd have declared the Kfir upon him, excommunicated him from the religion of Islam, and slit his throat. As for his wife, they would have had their way with her, ravaging the poor lady on the false pretext of her ridda, apostasy, for having been married to an apostate. And as for their children, they'd have been sold into slavery. I had to make the brother question his existing convictions, convincing him anew that the greater jihad for him was in Europe, calling his people to Islam and all while avoiding leading him to incriminate himself by explicitly agreeing with anything I said. Simultaneously, I was trying to indirectly impress upon his commanders that it was in their wider interests, if the interests of Islam mattered to them at all, to let the brother and his family go. It was a total mind f- head. But I have the head for it, mind. It's just you can't raise your head to be seen. Not all battles can be fought while standing on a proverbial podium at Speaker's Corner. Freak sure that that is. A brother in one country told me that had I not planted the seeds of the Dawa in his particular region, it would have likely descended into a second Chechnya. That's too much power for one man to have. Well, a mighty big exaggeration for sure. But the fact remains that the only grassroots dawah that was carrying the youth away like a torrent in the territory in question was the dawah of Takfir and Tafjir. I bought to them the dawah of Tasfiyah and Tarbiya. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. And the dawah to the Sunnah is now flourishing throughout the area. The delicate duty of inoculating vulnerable communities in restive regions caught between the poisonous extremism of the jihadi and the persecutions of the extreme Sufi, whilst buttressing a congregation's overall knowledge base and the callers' Islamic competence, is most effective when its practitioners enjoy freedom of movement. In any case, we want people to follow principles, not personalities. We shine a light on the Quran and Sunnah, shying away from the limelight. So you've completed your pilgrimage and are now in the city of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You find yourself at the north side of Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, as if exiting via the rear entrance. Opposite the mosque's courtyard, you'll find an indoor exhibition complex. The exhibition on the beautiful names of Allah is my project. Well, partially mine, 
I supervise the tail end of the all-important English language component. Medina's municipality had awarded the tender to create the exhibition to a local company. However, that company had fallen perilously close to failing to deliver the goods on schedule, so they asked me to bail them out. By Allah's permission and mercy, my team and I came to the rescue and helped the vendor meet the deadline in time for the exhibition's grand opening. So now, inshallah, the pilgrims visit the mosque of his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after having worshipped at the Kaaba in Mecca. And should they visit our exhibition too, they return to the Prophet's mosque and their homeland thereafter to again offer prayers. But this time, praising, glorifying and supplicating to Allah with a greater appreciation of his beautiful names. Light upon light, while we work in the shadows. Oh, you think darkness is your ally? Yes, I do. And I hope, inshallah, I've exposed enough of myself here without actually exposing myself. And I hope I have given enough of an insight to give at least a modicum of confidence that what I publish reflects a degree of competence in my presentation of beneficial knowledge.